Awesome. So thanks everyone again for joining us uh, this week. We're, we're really excited to kind of give you guys more background on uh, the Rhone Valley as a whole. So we're really excited to be helping uh, having Patrick Will uh, join us today. Um, he will be walking us through a lot of the Rhone Valley. Um, it's everything, you know, kind of where it is, its history, its background, and then really diving in deeply on kind of Gigal um, and touching on the other producers in our collection. So as a reminder, our, our Rhone Valley collection is live right now. Um, we have wines from Gigal, Pegao, um, Chaputier, um, and Jaboulet. So we have, a, we have a good mix from the Northern and Southern Rhone, really with a focus on the Northern Rhone. And today, Patrick will kind of walk us through what's what makes each little area in the Northern Rhone kind of special and then why the wines from the Rhone Valley as a whole are, are so unique. So welcome, Patrick. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate it, Billy, and welcome, everyone. Um, just a little bit of background so you know where I'm coming from. I don't know how many, I may know some of you, maybe not, uh, but uh, I've um, been working in the, the importing, the wine importing business now for 26 years in the wine business for 35. Uh, I've worked with the Gigal family now for fully 26 years and have been to the, the winery probably oh, 40 or 50 times and uh, spent a lot of time in the Rhone. I also teach uh, I have been teaching the uh, until COVID the uh, uh, master class on uh, Roan in uh, for the CIA up in uh, Santa Elena, and uh, also have, uh, I am a, a member of uh, was inducted into the Brotherhood of Chateau Neuf de Pop back in 2008. So just a little resume so that you feel comfortable um, uh, maybe putting some uh, credence of what I'm about to say. So we are going to go on a blisteringly fast tour of the northern and southern Rhone with a little bit of deep background. And I probably, uh, unless, um, and some of you can put it in the chat if you're interested, um, emphasize a little less of the viticulture uh, 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 aspect because that's a, uh, maybe, a, maybe a bit geeky, but uh, let's talk a little bit about the basics. And uh, I apologize in advance if this is a uh, uh, relatively, uh, you know, uh, intro 101 kind of presentation, but that's uh, the level I wanna make sure that we're all uh, um, on the same page and, and, and so forth. So questions are welcome. And um, particularly if there's something that's uh, either unclear or um, needs a little more um, elaboration. So you obviously, uh, I worked with Gigal for a long time. That's the first slide there. And now my screen is locked. Goodness, let's see, page down. There we go. So it'll be a little slow. So just a quick, uh, a quick orientation, uh, if this doesn't jump uh, ahead. Um, the Rhone Valley, as if you can see my cursor, Rhone Valley is located in the southeastern part of France. I always think of France uh, as a um, sort of a clock face, if you will. In fact, a lot of times when I travel there, uh, if I'm doing a, a multi-region um, tour or visit, uh, we'll start up in Paris, of course, and hit Champagne, Alsace, go down through Burgundy, through the Rhone, the Languedoc, up through Bordeaux, and finish in the Loire before you return to Paris. So a clockwise tour. And so if you think of it that way, uh, the Rhone Valley essentially is at uh, four or five o'clock on the, on the French wine clock. The um, uh, Rhone Valley, as you can see, is, is actually quite two, uh, two regions. I'll move to the next slide here. Um, and uh, it's a, um, a region which has a, a very interesting geo history. I'll talk about that in a second. But in general terms, uh, the uh, northern Rhone, uh, which is the upper part of the screen there, the map just uh, south of the town of Vienne, uh, and then the Southern Rhone, those are the two uh, delimited regions of this, uh, or, of this region. And uh, they are uh, as different as you could be. In fact, uh, many people have argued that they should actually be different uh, Appalachian, uh, they are different Appalachians, but um, they should be essentially considered two separate regions. I think that's probably fair. They're divided by a fairly big uh, agricultural region uh, north of Montelimar here. And the climates are, are totally different. Uh, in the north, which is a very narrow river valley, it's a continental climate, so that means four seasons. Uh, you have a, a good chance of rain in the fall, and uh, much like we see four seasons on the east coast and that sort of thing. Um, in the south, you move uh, from a, a narrow river valley to a broad alluvial plain uh, center, centered on uh, the appellation that we're going to spend some time on a little bit later, Chateau neuf de Pop. And uh, this region is uh, is is uh, comprised uh, by is uh, characterized, pardon me, by a Mediterranean climate. 
So uh, quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of sunshine uh, compared to the north, uh, much warmer temperatures, uh, and uh, a, a very different weather pattern overall. Um, but both are subsumed under the re under the category Rhone Valley, and the reason for that, of course, of two distinctly different regions, is they're tied together by the River Rhone. Um, the Rhone flows out of um, Lake Geneva and uh, flows uh, due west uh, until it reaches uh, the city, what is now the city of Lyon, and, uh, and it connects up with the Saone River there and then uh, turns southward and, and marches pretty much directly down to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, along the way, uh, it's a, of course, it's a, it's a wide river. It's a, it's a river that was a, a very um, important uh, base for commerce. Uh, commercial travel uh, uh, thousands of years ago. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we have the culture that has grown up along the river and along these two regions that, that you see today, both the viticultural aspect, the winemaking, and of course the historic uh, aspect. Um, I show this uh, touristy picture of the Pont de Garde because this is located just a little west of Chateauneuf de Pape and Tavelle in the south. Uh, this is just to give you an idea the Roman influence and before that the Greek influence in this region were absolutely essential to what um, uh, to how it developed. Uh, the Greeks, of course, first came, came up uh, the river and that's uh, introduced vinifera. Uh, grape varieties there, uh, we, we expect that's the case. Uh, the Romans came in in much more organized fashion um, a couple hundred years later, about 300 BC, and uh, began to develop uh, uh, a lot of uh, obviously very sophisticated architecture. This is an aqueduct you're looking at, uh, still exists uh, today. and. Uh, uh, it really settled and created uh, what we know as the development of the cities and so forth along the river uh, that we know today. Uh, so just a quick, uh, you know, some key, key facts that we just covered. Viticulture, I talked about a little bit, history of that there. It's a bifurcated region, sorry, to, <clears throat> pardon me, north and south of different climates. And it's actually the third largest AOC in France. Uh, so the, after uh, Bordeaux being the first and Burgundy being the second in terms of the production. So uh, quite a substantial region and uh, a very, uh, very important overall for uh, wine production in France. Um, really quickly, we're gonna talk, I usually go north to south, uh, south to north here, rather um, Appalachian hierarchy in the Southern Rhone, so we know where we are. Uh, you have the uh, non-Rhone, um, essentially AOPs or AOCs, the same thing, Appalachian Controle is now Appalachian Protégé, just by the way, uh, changed about 10 years ago, but both are still valid. Uh, and th those include Luberon and Ventoux and so on. And then you have what I call the sort of uh, the uh, bread basket of, of comfort food wines in the Southern Rhone, which is Cote d'Rhone, the regional appellation at the next level up, number four. And that um, comprises most of the production of, of what we know as Rhone wine, uh, Cote d'Rhone, red, white, and rosé. Above that, Cote d'Rhone village, uh, those are uh, 95 delimited villages that are uh, thought to have better, have been found to have better soils and uh, older vines. Uh, and better aspects for producing better wines. And uh, those have been uh, singled out. They're allowed to put uh, um, uh, the name Cote Rhone Village on the bottling. And then at the very top of that hierarchy is the 20, uh, 22 villages, which actually can include their geographic name, such as uh, uh, Plain de Dieu, uh, Massif du Chaux, Sablé, and so forth. Uh, at the very top of the, of the pyramid in the Southern Rhone is the, uh, are the crews. And namely, uh, our primary focus today is Chateauneuf de Pape, which is um, the, uh, uh, the most important and largest crew of the Southern Rome. But you also have Gigondas, Tavel, Kairan, uh, et cetera, uh, Vacaras, uh, as part of the crew uh, grouping there in the South. Fairly typical viticulture uh, in the Southern Rome. And this brings me to um, uh, what I was gonna mention earlier, which is to say the, the development of this region geologically, uh, basically the Northern Rhone is a very tight, relatively tight, uh, narrow river valley uh, that was created by uh, glaciation that basically rubbed, a, uh, basically carved a path uh, on, on the east side of the Massif uh, Central in France uh, against that very strong granite um, uh, granite uh, uh, embankment there. And, and on, the, on, the, uh, on the west side rather, on the east side, of course, you have the Alps and the glaciation occurred, really carved out this river valley in the north, leaving fairly steep granite terraces. And once it got past the uh, girdle, if you will, of the Alps and the Massif Central in France and the, the granitic uh, girdle, if you will, uh, the, the uh, glacial, glaciers basically deposited a whole lot of debris on the plain that is the alluvial, now we call it the, the alluvial plain of the Southern Rhone. And it leaves deposits such as these uh, river stones, as you can see, but also a lot of clay and sand that underlie these kind of uh, vineyard uh, um, overlays and uh, creates the need for this kind of uh, viticulture in the south. Um, moving quickly to the north, uh, we talked 
about that as a continental climate. Here you have the uh, the pyramid is reversed, reversed it's upside down. Uh, most of the uh, most of the vineyard area that's classified is part of a crew, uh, namely Roti, Condria, Hermitage, San Joseph, Croz Hermitage, Cornas, etc. Uh, there was a very uh, small amount of Cote de Rhone produced now compared to the south, which is about 75 to 80 percent of the production in the southern Rhone is just basic regional Cote de Rhone. In the north, that's limited to only about five percent. Almost all the vineyards are so categorized as um, Cote de Rhone, as, as a crew rather. And then you have a, a very interesting category called IGP Colline Rodanienne, and that uh, allows for grape varieties that are not indigenous to the Rhone Valley, uh, like Merlot and uh, and other uh, um, non-typical uh, grape varieties uh, to be uh, to be used in the in the production. And here's a little map of the Northern Rhone. We're gonna be spending time in Cote Roti and in Hermitage. So at the very Northern uh, grow of the Northern part of the growing region in the, in, the, uh, in the classified region of the Northern Rhone, and then uh, uh, down in the middle, about 40 miles South in, in Hermitage. And here, is a, here are a couple photographs of the kinds of, uh, of terraces you see in the North. They're much more distinctly dramatic than you have in the South. They're more similar to what you might find in the Rheingau in Germany. Uh, here's another example. These are essentially granite or decomposing granite. Uh, they've been terraced, uh, or terraces were filled, first built about 2,500 years ago, from what we know. And uh, they are devilish difficult to maintain. They're constantly being eroded, but it is the way uh, that the grapes have been grown for centuries, uh, millennia in the Northern Rhone, uh, because uh, uh, these uh, these terraces essentially in a, in a continental climate where sunshine is at a premium, uh, they act as a uh, sun, uh, essentially a uh, sun trap, if you will. Uh, I think I think of a think of a big direct TV screen trying to uh, antenna trying to focus the uh, energy. Um, viticulture, uh, I, miss, I promise we'd sort of skip through this uh, in the in the interest of spending a little more time on uh, on the, the wines themselves. But any questions, I can. Uh, uh, Bring up one one comment I would make. Uh, this is a, a form of viticulture which is uh, typical in Northern Rhone and is in fact uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, almost unique to the Northern Rhone. Uh, there have been a couple of people in my part of California in Santa Barbara that are um, have been using this type of uh, eschala uh, uh, trellising system. Uh, these are just basically two wood poles lashed together at the top, and each of them has a, a vine on, on each uh, each footing, and uh, they 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 train. The, uh, the, the cordons up these poles and create sort of a, a, a big, a kind of a bushy um, um, vine, uh, which are not, not connected by, uh, by trellises uh, as they are in, in, uh, in uh, many other parts of the world. And that is particularly because of the, of the as angle of sunlight and the difficulty of, uh, uh, of accessing that on these uh, steep terraces. So that's, uh, that was built essentially to uh, accommodate this kind of viticulture. A real quick review of grape varieties. Um, uh, red wines uh, in the south, these, and red, I always call the south the kitchen sink of, of uh, viticultural regions, pardon me. <clears throat> uh, Grenache is the dominant red variety, but you also have Mourad, Syrah, Sanso, Cunois, Vacares, Muscardin, etc. A lot of varieties, and if you get outside of the Appalachian, Appalachian Control A regions into the regional Appalachians, you have um, Carignan and, and some other varieties uh, that are allowed within uh, with to be blended into basic Cote de Rhone and so forth. For the whites, again, the kitchen sink applies. It's Grenache Blanc and Claret and Marsan, uh, really the two uh, biggest, uh, um, uh, the three biggest uh, varieties there. But you also have uh, Roussan, uh, various different colors of Tourette. Uh, Berberlanc is quite important, especially in certain Cote de Rhone white blends. And uh, in, in Cote de Rhone Blanc, uh, not in the Appalachian, in the Cruz, shall we say, such as Chateau Neuf de Pop, uh, which makes a white, has a white version. Uh, Viognier is not permitted in the Cruz, but it is permitted in the regional Appalachians. Moving to the north, we have, it's much easier. Uh, we have Syrah as the red grape uh, that is permitted in the Cruz all the way down to the regional uh, Appalachians. So any regional uh, Cote de for example, red that you get uh, buy from a producer in the north will be Syrah. Uh, so if you know, for example, August Clapp, uh, beautiful producer in Cornos, they produce a small amount of Cote de that is a beautiful, that's uh, actually Young Vines, uh, Syrah, Young Vines and Cornas uh, for the most part. Uh, and then the, for white wines, um, of course, Marsan and Roussan predominant, Marsan by far the dominant white variety in the North um, because it's relatively easy to farm. Uh, that always is attractive to growers. Uh, Roussan is a difficult grape variety, but it is important, particularly in uh, the Appalachian of, of Appalachians of Hermitage and, uh, and San Joseph. 
Viognier is permitted only in the two AOCs of Condria and the tiny uh, Appalachian that's uh, embedded within Condria, which is uh, Chateau Grier. And uh, that's, uh, and by the way, that is the ancestral home of the Viognier grape variety. Everything we know about Viognier that, and we experience uh, around the world uh, comes from the, a very, very small vineyard um, known as Condria. So um, that is my quick tour of the uh, Rhone Valley. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions in the chat. I don't see anything yet. But um, let me uh, pivot now very quickly to uh, the family that I've been working with for over a quarter century now, um, and uh, very, very honored to be, have done so. That's a picture of the Chateau d'Ampuy. In the town of Ampuy, uh, this is the uh, northernmost uh, viticultural region, a classified viticultural region in the Rhone. And I say that because uh, uh, classified because there were more northerly vineyards in, um, in this part of the Rhone Valley and on the other side of the river. Uh, until you get to Hermitage, everything is on the west bank of the river. Uh, until Air and, uh, but there were some vineyards in a region known as Sosel, uh, and um, that's on the right bank uh, at this point, or on the east side of the river. Uh, those, there are some vineyards that have been reconstructed, historic vineyards reconstructed there that have been, uh, per, that are being uh, 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 farmed by a, a group called the uh, Van de Vienne. Uh, a, a, a small group of, uh, of growers who are making some very interesting wines from that, but uh, it's not uh, not AOC at this point. Uh, and uh, so these are you're looking at the, at this uh, architectural edifice, the Chateau d'Ampuy, which the Gigals now own, uh, and uh, but it is a historic landmark. It sits at the base of uh, the most important vineyards of Cote Rotie. We'll talk about a little bit very quickly the family history. That's Etienne Gigal. Uh, in his uh, later years, he founded this winery in 1946 after working for 30 some years in the vineyards uh, with um, uh, both on his own and with a, a firm called Vidal Fleury, which is the oldest negociant in the Rhone Valley. Uh, he, uh, Etienne, uh, uh, really worked his way up from the age of 14, tying up vines and picking apricots to become the uh, general manager and winemaker at Vidal Fleury. And then after World War II, he hung out his own shingle in the town of Ampuy uh, with the name of the, of the family operation, Igigal. This is an example the cellars that existed then. Uh, and uh, you can see barrels of Cote Roti lining the uh, wall. That cellar still exists. It's been extended maybe 30 uh, fold, if you will. Uh, and uh, it's a much more substantial and, and important uh, uh, operation. Now, all the Gigal wine, by the way, is stored in these cellars. Uh, despite their large production, they have enough uh, room in their new cellars. And I'll show you some of that in a minute to, uh, to manage this, all, all of their wines north and south. Um, there uh, is a little family history in a nutshell. Uh, uh, Etienne, who passed away in 89, uh, is carved into the foudre in the middle there. Marcel, uh, Etienne, and, and, and um, his wife's only child um, is in the middle there. Uh, and Philippe, uh, that's uh, Marcel and Bernadette's only child as well, uh, is on the right. Philippe looks a little bit older now. Uh, but uh, I would point out Marcel uh, took over the winery when he was only 17 years old. Uh, took over in the 60s, and he, his father had a mild stroke and went blind for a period of time, recovered uh, but maybe 90, 96 or 97 percent, not 100 percent. And um, so Marcel basically uh, dropped out of school to uh, take over the winery, and uh, turns out his acumen in the business and viticultural um, uh, and winemaking uh, areas are second to none in the Rhone, and uh, it's, uh, he's been called the greatest winemaker on the planet the greatest elever, meaning the greatest uh, ager of wines on the planet by Robert Parker. Uh, and I think uh, there's been nothing in the, in the last 10 or 15 years done to dissuade anybody from that, um, that opinion. Uh, Philippe has followed in, in Marcel's footsteps uh, in a way that is, uh, I'm, I'm just, it's absolutely uh, breathtaking. Uh, Philippe is, uh, is, a, is trained uh, internationally. He's done stages at, uh, at that Penfolds, at uh, Cheval Blanc in Bordeaux and in Burgundy and in California. Um, and he has a, a terrific viticultural training. He's multilingual and uh, is uh, as one of the best palates um, I've ever encountered uh, at, uh, in, a, in a winemaker. Here's a picture of the Gigal cellar. This actually is the first addition to the cellar, which is now expanded many, many times beyond this. Is, these barrels are all made in-house uh, by their own cooperage. And um, this, uh, you may notice, you may say, is that marble floor? Yes, it is marble floor. Uh, they have marble underneath almost all of the, of the barrel rooms at Gigal now. And uh, I would point out that uh, because the TGV runs not far behind this uh, cellar and creates a certain amount of vibration, uh, the Gigals were concerned about that. So when they installed that floor in that cellar, they included um, vibration isolation springs 
uh, under each of those blocks of marble. And I point that out not to, to sound like I'm going to head into architecture here, but rather to say that the, the Gigal's attention to detail is really quite uh, astonishing. So, uh, it, uh, and, and their attention to detail and winemaking and wine aging and bottling is where they go. It's it's 100% of what they do. Marketing, um, they've never really had to do marketing. Uh, people have come to them since the very first day um, of, of these uh, these wines. I should point out um, my uh, my ex-business partner was the initial importer for Gigalas, Frederick Eck. Some of you may know him. Uh, he founded classic wine imports in Boston. He began importing Gigal in the 60s. And we partnered up in the 90s to, uh, to basically build the company from there. And uh, then that's how I ended up with Vintus when we merged uh, with, uh, with the Vintus portfolio. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Appalachians in, in play here. Um, Cote Roti, here is, uh, these are the five um, uh, Cote Rotis that Gigal produces. We'll talk in detail about the single vineyards at the bottom there, La Moline, La Landon, and La Turc in uh, chronological order of their appearance in the catalog. Chateau d'Ampuy is a relative newcomer, uh, started in 1995. And of course, the very familiar Brune Blonde de Gigal, uh, which is their basic, I won't say every day, but it's a basic Cote Roti. Uh, it is um, blends here for Cote Roti, just so you know, of course, red, it's a red wine. There is no white wine produced independently in Cote Roti. It is strictly red, but there is uh, up to up to 20% Viognier allowed in the blend. That's because there used to be a white Cote Roti. And when they changed the Appalachian, they codified the Appalachian rules in the 30s. They said uh, basically no more white, but you can keep the white grapes in the, in the vineyard. And so that's where we end up with, uh, in this particular bottling, 4% Viognier, uh, 20 to 30 months in barrel with between 40 and 80% new. This is an ex uh, a little overview of the of the three uh, departments or the three communes, pardon me, of uh, Cote Roti. Um, and looking straight down on them, uh, you're looking basically the south is on the left and the north is on the right. So starting at the south, they have the commune of Tupin Saint-Mont, or some very nice vineyards there, but not the not the sweet spot. On the north side, you have Saint Cyr Silleron, uh, and it's also a little cooler region uh, and uh, a little bit more. Uh, difficult uh, to ripen. The big sweet spot for uh, Cote Roti, of course, is the commune of Ampuy. And uh, the vineyards here that I'm circling are all part of what would be called the Cote Blonde. And that's how you saw that re reference on the Gigal label we were just uh, uh, showing on the screen. The Cote Blonde is the southerly uh, sweet spot, if you will, within the, the commune of Ampuy. It's named after the, uh, the, the Lieu de Cote Blonde, but it also refers to the types of soil that exists there, which are, there's some sand and limestone, there's decomposed granite, uh, but generally lighter soils. There's a lot of quartzite, especially as you go down the hill. Uh, and uh, that creates a very minerally, very, uh, very expressive form of Syrah. And, uh, and the and Bionier grape does very well in those soils as well. Um, if you move beyond that to the north, uh, this side here, you get into the um, Cote Brune, and uh, that is uh, named after, uh, well, there's a, another legend which we can save for another time, but the name really comes from the, uh, the, the, the uh, soil, which is predominantly schist. And there's a lot of iron oxide in the soil there, very different uh, soil series than you found in the, in the Cote Blonde. And uh, in this case, uh, there's a lot of decomposed granite, also a lot of hard granite. And as I mentioned, schist, the iron oxide gives the uh, Syrah grape a very, very hard tannin and um, creates a wine that's a uh, smoky, sauvage, and a lot more um, structure than the uh, Cote Blonde. And uh, there's generally less Viognier planted in the north. So, so the Cote Brune on the north, the Cote Blonde on the south, just to give you a little orientation there. And then these are all the Liodis that exist uh, on the um, cadastral records there in Cote Roti. Um, so here, switching real quickly, uh, we're going 40 miles south. We're gonna talk about this appellation, Hermitage. You're looking straight across at the hill of Hermitage there. Uh, from the uh, a vineyard that is called uh, is uh, part of the San Joseph Appalachian. The town in the foreground is Tournon. The town across the river is Tain L'Hermitage. Uh, Hill of Hermitage is 309 acres of plantable vineyard. Uh, it, it peters off as you move east as the, as the hill uh, kind of levels off. You end up in Crow's Hermitage for the Appalachian Crow's Hermitage, which also extends behind this hill and also down about uh, most of the vineyards are south of the, of the city, town of Tain L'Hermitage. Uh, Hermitage Hill, of course, is known for making perhaps the most powerful Syrah in this part of France, maybe in, in France altogether. And uh, in addition, it makes extremely powerful white wines. Uh, the soil types are somewhat varied. Uh, we're going to talk about a wine from the Lieu de Lermite. Uh, we'll talk, uh, can show that that's a, that's a picture of a hill, uh, hillside in Hermitage, similar kind of terracing than you find uh, as you find in Cote Roti. Um, but uh, it's predominantly granite. 
And uh, here you've got um, uh, an overview. Again, this is a map of the, of the various vineyards in Hermitage. We're going to be talking about a, a, a wine from Chapoutier called Lermite, which is a, a, a fabulous hillside uh, a vineyard, uh, but close to the top, if you know uh, uh, where uh, uh, the chapel, the chapel is that uh, La Chapelle is named after. It's up there on Lermite uh, on that part, and of course the famous vineyards Les Bessard, which is arguably the best vineyard on the hillside. So moving a little further, um, we'll talk a little bit about these wines before we get into Chateau Neuf to Pop. This is a, a single vineyard or a selection parcellaire from uh, Chapoutier, and uh, these wines are aged generally in uh, a fair amount of new oak. Uh, but they're quite limited, uh, 3,000 um, bottles or so produced in, a, in an average year. 16 is an exceptionally good year in the Northern Rhone because of the, uh, because of the uh, uh, you know, balance of acidity and, and the ripeness of the tannins, uh, not as over the top as 15 uh, or 19 is, or 18 for that matter. So it's a, it's a long aging wine that will, is a vintage that's very highly regarded. And I just make the point about the production. We're going to look at wines in this particular, that are part of this grouping that are all, um, uh, they're all limited in production, which of course uh, it makes that's adds to their value in a sense. But the scarcity itself means they're in uh, in great demand among the people who are interested in these wines. And these are some, this is the creme de la creme of um, uh, a collection of, of uh, a selection, if I may, if I may, of, of the wines of this part of the Rhone. So Lermite, uh, again, uh, it's very hard to find, and uh, but uh, really I can't recommend it highly enough. And also just as an aside. Uh, Chapoutier's whites uh, uh, selection parcel are, are magnificent. Uh, here is the another part of the collection, important part, 2015 La Chapelle. Um, of course, this is a wine to conjure with, going back to the perfect wines from 60 and 67 and Parker's ratings. And uh, it was after the Fry family took over about 20 years ago from uh, the Jabolais uh, uh, family. It took a little while for them to come back around. Um, and um, this uh, now starting, I think, before this vintage, but with the 15 vintage for sure, uh, La Chapelle is back on target uh, uh, for you know, as one of the great wines of the Rhone Valley. Uh, production here is more robust, uh, 10,000 or more bottles a year, maybe even higher, depends on the vintage. Um, again, 100% Syrah here, uh, very long lived wines. Uh, the vintages of the late 80s and early 90s are still not mature. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience opening bottles too soon, uh, but they are, uh, are, are one of the greatest wines to put in the cellar and just simply forget. Um, and um, I think we're, I think that's all the Hermitage, if I'm not mistaken, I may have miss, missed one there. Um, maybe, but, uh, oh, did I miss a, an Hermitage in there somewhere? Right. Nope, you're, you're spot on. Okay, so... Uh, quickly pivoting to the Mediterranean climate of Chateau Neuf de Pop, and we're right at 30 minutes, so I'm going to try to blast through this real quick. Um, and I'll see, uh, Billy, maybe you could do me the favor of checking the questions uh, that come up and, um, and maybe uh, asking me those as, uh, at an appropriate time. So Chateau Neuf de Pop, um, one of the wonderful things about this region is you're starting to see, um, it's, it used to be considered just sort of a basic high alcohol, big wine. It had a certain character that everybody seemed to understand and so on. And, and it was a very, very popular, especially among negociants. There are a lot of negociant bottlings and I'm not talking about Gigal or Jabalé uh, as much as I am people like B&G and some of the bigger, you know, big commercial negociants because it was a recognizable name, the largest appellation in the Southern Rhone. And now happily, and I've spent a lot of time with Philippe Gigal in their new property, Chateau de Nalis in Chateau Neuf de Pop. Uh, they're really starting to see people pay attention to the diff to the uh, combination of soil types with grape varieties and and uh, the uh, the aspects and the expositions of these various vineyards, the height of the of the vineyards, which uh, the altitude, which varies only 100 meters uh, from uh, the lowest to the top to the highest. But the difference in the climates and the difference in the uh, wine quality is quite stunning. Uh, as you start to really dive into that. Um, so there are five communes in Chateau Neuf de Pop with the, uh, the namesake Chateau Neuf de Pop being the largest. Uh, you also have orange to the north and the green, uh, uh, relatively, uh, it's okay, a decent, decent uh, vineyard area. More importantly, Courtezon to the, uh, to the uh, east of that and the north, the blue, the light blue, Betaride. Uh, and I should point out Courtezon is where Chateau Beaucastel is located. In fact, that triangle at the very top that is predominantly the vineyard called Coudelet, which is uh, Bocastel's vineyard. And then um, 
Uh, and then in better reed, which is extremely rocky and extremely uh, high quality soil, including the great vineyards of La Croix. And uh, that is, of course, uh, memorialized on the Via Telegraph label. Uh, and they are uh, the, one of the largest producers there. And uh, then you have the slightly less, you know, lower quality area called Sorg. It's a lot lower lying land. That's the lowest uh, altitude of any of the vineyards in Chateauneuf. But the nice thing, we're seeing great selection parcellaires single vineyard wines, special cuvées coming out of Chateau de Pop, which are terrific for investment. Here is an example. This is La Croix. These are Gobelet pruned vines in Chateau de Pop, and you can see the Galerie Roulets, the uh, um, river stones there that create a lot of the, uh, uh, the, the heat summation there in Chateau de Pop, if you will. So um, really quickly about the wines here. This is uh, the uh, one of the wines in the collection, Homage. Uh, this uh, Chateau de Boca cell, of course, makes a brilliant Chateau de Pop, and they have for generations, homage is a particular cuvee which has heavy on Mourved and old vine um, inclusion, uh, old vine cuvee for, from the uh, Perrin family. Uh, it is uh, quite rare, um, aged, uh, it's only 4,500 bottles produced in an average year. So uh, you can click that out, it's less than 400 cases available. Uh, a stunning wine and uh, a very considered the most ageable, as good as Bocastel itself is, this is considered the most age-worthy and investment-worthy wine uh, from Bocastel. It, uh, it really is, it's also quite difficult to find. And then moving to uh, the uh, Ferro family, uh, Laurence Ferro and her father, you can see that Paul Ferro, a fille, uh, the daughter is Laurent. And uh, the two of them uh, run the property, uh, Domaine Pego. Of course, their uh, primary uh, reserve cuvee is uh, every, on everyone's short list of great Chateau Neuf de Pops. And this is their cuvee de Capo. Uh, this is a, the Capo, I mean, uh, the top or the, the very top cuvee of the property. Uh, very florid, as you can see by the ABV statement on the lower left. Rich wine, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of Grenache. Uh, in this, but just a, a lot of ripeness, a lot of structure, and a very difficult wine to find. The Capo's production is about 6,000 bottles a year. So again, that is about a you know, uh, thousand cases of six bottles or 500 cases total. So, uh, and then finally, we're going to take a quick look at the three Gigal Coat Rotis that are the centerpiece, uh, and uh, partly, uh, I guess, the largest number of individual items in this collection. Uh, that is uh, looking up at the coat. Uh, Brune, uh, there uh, behind the Chateau d'Ampouille itself. Yep, Patrick. Uh, yes, sir. Before before we hop in here, let me, um, I can touch on a couple questions. They're Egal related. So before we dive in, I think you're going to answer some with what you're about to talk about. But the first question was, what can you say about Egal's perspective on aging and longevity in the cellar compared to other producers around the world? What techniques, philosophies um, make them successful in producing wines that handle age so well? And how common is it for a producer to achieve such quality? across all of their labels. And then part two is, um, you've obviously been successful bringing Gigal to the US. How has the reception been and how do you see the runway in the US or the demand kind of growing um, or not as well? So they, those are kind of two parters there. Well, let me start with the first, second question first. Uh, this is not a news conference, but that's a typical tactic. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the idea, it's, it's a, I think one of the things that's happening uh, I mean, Gigal was in large part responsible for uh, re, you know, resuscitating, if you will, Cote Roti and certainly Condrio along with George Vernet. But um, the, uh, you know, the Rhones weren't considered particularly investment wines. I mean, if you look at the difference in price in the in the 80s between La Moulin, for example, uh, it was still uh, underpriced compared to something like Lafitte, even though the production uh, was about, um, you know, I don't know how to put it, five percent of what Lafitte produces in, in a year, uh, less than that. And uh, so, the uh, I think what's happened, uh, what's what's happened more and more is uh, you're seeing uh, producers, uh, it's a lot of young, uh, it, you know, new generations or young new producers that are really aiming for an international audience, not an international style, okay, but an international audience with their wines, uh, which I think had, you know, if as recently as 30 years ago, Cote Roti was collectible, but not a, uh, I think. Uh, it wasn't a first first order uh, collector's wine, except for the people who really love the wines and love to drink them, uh, particularly these here. But I think uh, what's happened is that uh, the, the renown of these particular wines from Gigal has uh, lifted everybody's, you know, floated everybody's boats a little more. I mean, Jabalay went through a down period with La Chapelle, but they're back up on top with that now. And uh, I think uh, what's happened also, as you're seeing, um, is that it's uh, the Rhone has always been a sort of a step behind 
in uh, you know, Bordeaux and now Burgundy uh, with their, you know, their pricing and so on. And you, know, you saw with the vintage 2005 in Bordeaux that the Bordelais said uh, quite firmly after the speculation over 2000 vintage, they said quite firmly, we're gonna take the margin back. And they, they took their pricing up and squeezed uh, you know, all the, all the, a lot of the uh, collectors or, or rather the speculators out of the equation um, for a lot of the wines. Uh, Burgundy now is sort of doing that by default. Uh, that's, that's the prices of Burgundy have gone through the roof. Uh, and I think that's uh, that's partly just an availability, demand and availability issue. For the Rhone, I think what you're going to see that, I hope it doesn't happen in, 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 from a personal standpoint, uh, that things get overheated price-wise, but I think what you're starting to see is that uh, people are turning their eyes toward the Rhone wines for this, um, uh, for this Rhone cuvées, particular wines, and more other wines that we're not talking about today. Uh, there are certainly other wines you could target, uh, but uh, very, uh, uh, a very good investment wine. I mean, something like Jamais, for example, we've seen prices on those skyrocket. Those of you, uh, you know, who know the wines of Gonon, uh, the Gonon Estate in San Joseph, I mean, they've gone through the roof. And uh, and uh, so, if you have some, you know, ten-year-old vintage of Gonon, you're sitting on a gold mine, really. Um, the um, the other question is how to, about the ageability of the wines. Um, the, the I think you know as good as the viticulture has been at Gigal and their focus on that uh, their estate vineyard has uh, has increased of course but it wasn't the primary focus it wasn't the primary part of their production estate wines uh, it was a sort of a small part of their production their biz, their business was primary negotiant still is in terms of the volume, absolute volume of it and the focus from starting with Etienne Gigal and definitely continuing with Marcel and Philippe is that aging the wine in the cellar is is the real key. And the careful aging of these wines, of whether it's Cote Roti, which can be aged anywhere from uh, two and a half to three and a half years in barrel uh, before they, uh, therefore they're bottled and they're bottled without filtration or fining, or you go to a production, a very large production of wine like the Cote de Rhone, that's given two full years in oak, and not small oak, but foudre, um, and um, even further aging in some cases before it's bottled. And that's a 15 to $18 bottle of red or white red wine and uh the gigal, gigal care in in that elevage if you will is really um the key there and it, it it starts at the bottom frankly and it and it pervades everything all the way up to the top parker said something very interesting he said something a, a number of times i i agree with him because i've had the experience of it gigal wines are better after bottling than they are out of barrel which is usually just the opposite um, and uh, so it speaks also to their extraordinary care and their very soft bottling uh, approach. So there, uh, you know, if you had to ask them, um, uh, the, two, the two things that really hold the Gigal uh, reputation up for people, uh, if you had to ask Philippe or I'm sure Marcel, they would say, first of all, work with great vineyards, whether your vineyard sources are a grower that works with that vineyard or whether you own the vineyard. And the other side is really, really do a bang up job raising the wine in the cellar. Because if you don't do that, you lose everything you've done, you've worked in the vineyard for. I hope I answered that question um, okay. Um, so, and again, in the interest of time, um, this this was this is a vineyard La Moulin. Uh, it was bought from by Marcel Gigal and his father uh, in 1963 from the Derbia uh, family. That, that that particular family, uh, the vineyards that they owned, most of those vineyards became the Rostang vineyards. And I will say, a uh, collector alert. Um, uh, part of the vineyard uh, called Fonjean, which is uh, still part of the Rostang estate, uh, a new part of that vineyard became available to the Gigals. It's in the Cote Brune right next to La Turque, and they are going to be bottling a fourth Cote Roti in a couple of years. Uh, La La, it's called La Reynard. Uh, so that uh, just uh, that coming down the pike uh, in a few years. Uh, this is an aerial view of La Moulin. It's the oldest vineyard uh, in the Gigal portfolio, one hectare, just two and a half acres. Uh, some of the vines date from 1886, and um, Predominantly uh, Syrah, but uh, there is uh, about 10% uh, Viognier in the vineyard. And production, as I said, is a, in a typical vintage, 4,500 bottles uh, and uh, bottled first in, in uh, 1966. Barrel aging, by the way, they used to, age, if you taste an older vintage from the 60s and 70s, this is, it was aged in food or not in barrel. So uh, that, that came along in the 70s and it was really a, um, an innovation uh, that Marcel Gigal brought to the table with those wines. Uh, the second Cote Roti that appeared under this uh, La La designation, pardon the uh, use of the term, is uh, La Landon. This was, uh, uh, began to, they, they acquired these, uh, the parcels of vineyard in the Liodi, uh, La Landon. And by the way, this is a Liodi. It's not a um, commercial name, whereas La Moulin and La Turque are names given to the 
individual vineyards by the Gigals, the bottlings by the Gigals. This is a Lyodi, you'll see La Landon uh, produced by Delas, you'll see it produced by Rostain. Uh, this was a parcel of a vineyard that Marcel took uh, over 10 years to acquire from small growers. He had, had 17 purchases to put together one vineyard of two and a half hectares, um, uh, 2.3 hectares to be precise. It is planted to 100% Syrah. It reaches a slope of nearly 60 degrees in, in, in some places. And uh, it, it is uh, this particular wine, uh, first vintage was 1978, uh, is, uh, is uh, first vintage was 78, as I mentioned. Production is about 10,000 bottles is all. It's never destemmed unless it's there is rot in the stems. And uh, eight, 2002 was the last vintage where there was a significant amount of destemming. Uh, and then this, just like the La Moulin and the following vin, uh, wine, La Turc, aged in brand new oak for 42 months, uh, extremely rare and hard to find. Uh, be, uh, although uh, La Landon is probably the easiest. Um, coming into the US, um, very, few, uh, very few bottles, or only about uh, a thousand bottles of each of these wines comes in the United States. Uh, La Turc is the most recent uh, of, this, of the Gigal Cote Rotis. First vintage was 1985. It was a complete replant uh, for them from a vineyard that it was on Friche. Uh, well, it was just, it was grown over. And it's just one hectare, it's been added to a little bit. Uh, this is 7% Viognier uh, inter, interplanted in the vineyard and uh, the La Turc is on the, it's on the Cote Brune. And again, that production here is a, a scant 42 to 4,500 bottles. Uh, the aging regimen is exactly the same as the other two. And I think um, uh, there is another picture of it. And I think I've hit the end of my um, um, presentation. I just wanna say thanks to everybody. I, if there are any questions last minute, I've gone over, I apologize, but uh, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, I'll, I'll just throw out one. Can you explain a little bit for everybody why, um, or not why, but how, how the Viognier is either like co-fermented and, and what it kind of does for the wines that it's, you know, it's not made separately. It's not added after it's kind of. No, it's never made separately. Um, right. So the, it's a really, it's a historic leftover as a great variety in the Cote Roti vineyards. And of course you understand that Cote Roti and Condria sort of overlap one another. So it's not surprising that Condria, where there's a lot of uh, uh, Viognier, it's all Viognier, um, they, uh, they really are close to, close to one another and uh, it's not surprising there'd be some uh, uh, overlap. But um, in any event, um, the, uh, the, the um, Cahier de Charge, uh, as they call the rules of the, of the viticulture in the France, in Cote Roti requires that the Condria, or sorry, Viognier be uh, interplanted in the vineyard, harvested coincidentally with the Syrah, so it can be very ripe or underripe depending. And um, then it's fermented, just thrown in the same vat, fermented together. And um, a reason for that really is so that you're not, uh, I, I don't know if there, I, I don't know if I can explain the reason for that, but in any event, uh, Viognier is not a particularly high acid variety, but it adds some, uh, some clear, clarity, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of aromatic character, which uh, sometimes for Syrah takes a little while to develop. And uh, it can, um, uh, essentially just add a little lightness and, and complexity to the wine. You know, you think, and it's, it may be something which, uh, you know, it's not essential to the, to viticulture, to the vinification and viticulture there. Um, you know, you think of Chianti and what did uh, with uh, um, Malvasia Bianco and, and Trebbiano, and they, they basically, they finally got the consortium to agree to, um, to take those great varieties out. So uh, we still call it uh, DOC Chianti Classico um, because they weren't really necessary. But back in the days, 100 years ago, before uh, temperature controlled fermentation, it was nice to have some white grapes to kind of leaven the sort of uh, the really heavy, heavy tannic reds and so forth uh, and uh, give it a little bit of extra aromatic character, which is generally blown off with a hot fermentation. So, yeah, that's part of it. Um, but the, uh, the, the uh, you know, I suppose it's shrouded in mystery as to how this developed. It's just one of those interesting romantic uh, quirks that exists uh, in the viticulture of Cote Roti. Yeah, I think it's interesting too. It's it's worked so well that you'll see that you know I know there's some producers in California and, and Australia when I was working there that um you know followed the same mantra because they just you know believed they made a well balanced wine. So I think that I mean, but you taste a I don't know what more balanced. I mean, I will say that La Moline is generally the most forward of the Cote Rotis of those three, and uh, La Landon takes a long time to come around because it's 100% Syrah and 100% stems and a different soil. So, um, you know, there, that's more schist, as I mentioned, and more iron oxide, which gives a harder Syrah. So anyway. Yeah, that's just an interesting subject. Um, no, I don't see any other um, main questions here. So um, I appreciate you taking the extra time here and, and going a little over. I know that was really, really fast for such a, such a broad area and a complex region, but I appreciate you. You it did is. a really good job there.
So thank you. Appreciate it. I uh, appreciate that. Thanks. I look forward to, I you know, hope everybody enjoyed it and, and uh, maybe I'll meet some of you at some point, but uh, uh, any event, uh, if it's any consolation, I have a big, I've made a big investment in my cellar in many of these same wines. So, and I've, I've enjoyed drinking them more than selling them at the end, but the other, the other option is possible and I've, uh, and they appreciate very nicely. So. Yeah. Yeah. As, as we always say, we're, we're not financial advisors and, you know, we're, we're looking back at our, you know, past performance is not an indicator of future performance, but these wines are delicious and, you know, people are, are really drinking them. So we're, I'm excited to have a couple myself over the holidays here. So um, thanks Patrick. And we'll, we'll continue to be in touch. We may, good. our investors may hear from you again. So that would be great. Very good. Look forward to it. Have a great holiday. Right. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.